everybody. Welcome back to Crime Weekly. I'm Stephanie Harlow. And I'm Derek Lavasser. So today we're diving into part three of the Lori Vallow, Chad Daybell saga, the never ending mm-hmm. saga, and the, the plot just keeps getting thicker. But before we dive in today, do you have anything you want to discuss, anything you want to mention at the top of the episode? We just got done recording Crime Weekly News. If you mm-hmm. haven't seen that, go check it out. And as I mentioned in Crime Weekly News, we just hit 50,000 followers on Instagram for crime, the Crime Weekly account. So as I said before, if you didn't see it, super appreciative of, of everything you guys are doing with us and, and following us on this journey. I actually give you a little bit behind the scenes. I didn't even say this on Crime Weekly News, but I was telling Stephanie, uh, Spotify had reached out to us and was just telling us how well our, our show is doing in comparison to other t- uh, podcasts across all podcast uh, platforms, how we're doing. And it was, I told Stephanie the numbers and she was shocked too. We really genuinely were shocked at how well it's doing and it, and it absolutely is because of you guys. So we how appreciate- How well is it doing? We're in the top 200 podcasts in the world, you know, and that's across all true crime. And not just true crime, just like yeah. in general. On Spotify. Yeah. On Spotify. I don't know about other platforms, but that's just for audio. That's not even for you guys who are watching on YouTube. So we're doing extremely well and we wouldn't be doing it or, or wouldn't be performing as well as we are without you guys. And that's why we put so much into this because we know- if you put out a good product and you and you tell these stories the right way and you're empathetic to the people involved in it and you do it in a way that's respectful to them and everybody else who's listening, then people will stick around and people will support you. And we're glad to see that that's, that's paying it off and that we're growing together and we're just going to keep it going. We're going to keep doing what we're doing and we'll, we'll go as far as you guys will allow us to or take us. So we're just very appreciative of that. Yeah. And like Derek said, obviously, without you guys listening, watching, et cetera, this this isn't even a thing, you know, exactly. it's it's not even us because there's a lot of people out there who put out a lot of good podcast content and just because they haven't gotten a following yet or they haven't hit that algorithm, they're they're going, you know, unnoticed. And we could be one of those podcasts, but because of you guys, we're not. So it's not like Crime Weekly is in the top 200 of all podcasts on Spotify. It's like Derek, Stephanie and every single person listening right now is in the top 200 because Mm -hmm. we did this together. So thank you so much. Mm -hmm. And we got some big news coming. You know, we talk about criminal coffee. We got some stuff coming that we are, we're chomping at the bit to tell you about. Champing. Is it champing? That's what I, it's champing at the bit, man. I think it's chomping at the bit. You're chomping at the bit. Like I know it, it makes sense. That you'd be chomping at the bit, but it's champing. You're the script writer, so I'm not going to debate you, you on that. Are you looking it up right now? Look it no, up. No, no, no. Hands are right here. Oh. Not looking it up. Well, I'm not saying you up. can. I wouldn't no, be I don't look offended it up. because it literally doesn't sound like it, it should make sense. I'm going to stick with chomping at the bit, but, you know, I'm probably wrong. And I acknowledge and that. And every time you say it, I'm going to say champing. I, I have a few things <laughs> that I say that are definitely not grammatically correct or English language whatsoever. But I that's know. fine. That's, that, that makes me me. It's awesome. So it's fine. But um, But that was really it. You, we're, we're excited about the stuff that's coming, uh, the stuff that's happening behind the scenes at Criminal Coffee, some of the, the cases that we've already donated to. So mm-hmm. we will we will keep you informed. And, and uh, you know, you're part of like Stephanie just said, you're part of the journey. And we're I say it all the time. We're just we're just getting started. It's, we're, this show is only less than two years old. So we're just we getting started. We've only just begun. OK, I'm done. I'm sorry. OK. It's already all right. 11 o'clock. I don't know how. Yeah. <laughs> Let's dive into today's episode. Should we? We should. By should the way, we? episode starts at 358. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. You're welcome. This is so stupid. <laughs> You're welcome. You're welcome. <laughs> All right, let's dive in without further ado. Mm -hmm. So we kind of left off. I don't know where we left off. We've been talked about so much, but basically we focused on like Lori Vallow for the most part. And uh, today we're going to talk about Chad Daybell. We're finally going to be introduced to Chad Guy Daybell. So um, but we have to kind of open this up to sort of revisit where we left Lori Vallow last week. So by 2018, Lori Vallow was fully committed to her new religious awakening, and she was actively listening to podcasts that explored ideas which were on the fringes of the Mormon faith, ideas like near-death experiences and having visions and being able to hear and see spirits from beyond the veil. Apparently, like, this is not something or these things are not really, like, actively taught or talked about in traditional mainstream Mormon 
kind of life. Lori was listening to a podcaster named Julie Rowe, who was also a published LDS author. Julie had published five books with a company called Spring Creek, which also happened to be Chad Daybell's publishing company. So what did Julie Rowe believe in and share with her listeners and followers? Well, let's look at one of her books to get that answer. This book is called From Tragedy to Destiny, A Vision of America's Future. (laughs) And the synopsis is as follows. Quote, in 2004, Julie Rowe was a happy wife and mother. Then her health took a turn for the worse. While in a weakened state, her spirit left her body and entered the spirit world. An ancestor named John greeted her there and showed her many wonderful places. He also allowed Julie to read from the Book of Life, which showed her a panorama of the Earth's past, present, and future. These scenes included the Savior's mortal life along with his crucifixion and resurrection. During her time in the spirit world, Julie met several of the founding fathers of the United States. They expressed their worries about the country's eroding moral fabric, and she promised to share their counsel and warnings when she returned to Earth. Julie was then shown upcoming world events that will be both tragic and glorious. Earthquakes, famine, plagues, and wars are coming to the United States, but Julie saw how God is preparing places of safety to protect righteous people from the coming calamities. She was shown that after the turmoil, America will rise above these tragedies and fulfill its destiny as a bastion of freedom and liberty. Throughout the book, Julie stresses that we not delay our preparations for these coming troubles. These events are not far off, and from tragedy to destiny will help you be ready for what awaits America. End quote. And you're going to see this is a, a common thread in these sort of like offshoot LDS groups. These like, you know, they kind of are like culty, like they have message boards um, online, specifically the avowal message board that Chad was like a big part of. And these message boards you have to like pay to be a part of and they're very secretive and they basically are just saying like, hey, this time is coming. But if you're aware of it and you know, you'll be able to stock up food and make sure you have supplies and you'll be able to prepare like they're like big time preppers, right? Because they think that it's going to it's going to happen like the world's going to end, but they'll know a safe place to go and like ride out the apocalypse. And then they'll like come out kind of like Charles Manson. And his followers, like, that's what he told them. I'm not sure how familiar you are with Charles Manson, but he told them, like, listen, the race war is coming and we're going to go underground, right? And we're going to wait out the apocalypse. And while we're underground, we're going to turn into fairies and pixies and stuff. And we're going to get all these great powers. And then we're going to come up and rule the world because we're the chosen ones and we're the ones that are going to be left. It's a very common uh, theme among, like, these offshoot uh, fervent religious groups that that turn very culty. And you're going to see this and you're going to see that Lori is also suddenly preoccupied with the end times. And a lot of these people, almost all of them that followed Chad Daybell, followed him because of the fact that he had these near-death experiences. And he claimed that these near-death experiences put him closer to the other side. So now he has visions and he's getting all this like inside secret information that nobody else can get just simply because his veil is thinner or ripped or whatever. Yeah, the whole cold thing is fascinating to me. Any any case we talk about, it's so interesting when you look at it from a perspective, like I consider us to, to be somewhat sane, although we have our moments. Mm-hmm. But you think about the type of people that gravitate towards these groups. And they say a lot of the times when you have someone who's, who's starting a cult or gathering a group of people, in many instances, the people that they recruit, if you will, are people who are going through their own things. Mm-hmm. They're looking for something. They don't even know what exactly. that something is. But mm-hmm. these, as dangerous as these quote unquote cult leaders are, they have a knack for identifying these types of people, the people that are going to be most susceptible to their practices or their beliefs, because there's an opening there that somehow they're able to identify. And I believe we've talked about instances where Maybe it was Waco. Maybe we didn't talk about it, but you'd have these transients or people who were just trying to find themselves and may have been passing through this community. And, and, and those leaders were always there to pick them up and to be whatever it was that they were looking for at the time, whether that's a father, a brother, a sister, a mother. They they would fill the role, that void that that individual was looking for. And by filling that role physically, they could implement the beliefs behind whatever they, they were trying to uh, promote. And that person who was has lost their way is more willing to accept it because they just want to have someone that that you know that they can they can look to for guidance. And so, 
the whole thing is fascinating. I know we were doing this case and we're calling it the, you know, the Daybell Colt case, you know, but I think it's going to be interesting to do a case with you down the road where we specifically really focus on maybe it is Charles Manson that we do, but something where we can really dive into the psychology behind that because I do think it's very fascinating. Heaven's Gate would be a good one to do. The Hellbop Comet. I'm down. I'm down. I'm down to really dive into one and look at it from that perspective, that angle. Like, how does it come to be? Right. We know the ending. We know where it gets really bad and then everyone knows about it. But how did we get there? I think that's fascinating. I mean, I've done a lot of work on like cult stuff because it, it fascinates me. Right. Um, and I look at something like this and I understand because I, I always try to put myself in like people's shoes. You know, maybe you, people don't think I do this, but I, I do do this. I understand being afraid of like the end times. And I understand if you're a deeply religious person. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with being deeply religious, but if you're deeply religious, that is sort of an underlying theme, you know, like, oh, there's going to be like a second coming and only the faithful survive. Like that's a theme amongst kind of like all religions, right? That there's this like there's this time that it's going to be, you know, like over and we're going to be judged. That is all religions kind of have that in there. I understand being terrified of that and trying to sort of like find a way to almost like avoid it, you know, because it's scary. And so if you have a group, this offshoot group that that opposes as LDS and they're like, oh, hey, there is a way to avoid it. You can prep and you can be ready and you can be vigilant and you can, you know, t listen to us because we're going to tell you. We're going to tell you when it's all going to go down and we're going to tell you where you can go and how you can be safe. You just got to listen to us. You got to come to our conferences. You got to give us money. You got to pay to be in the message boards and we're going to make sure you're OK. I completely understand how somebody could like kind of fall into that, especially if you've got a lot of people who seem to be normal. Like look at Julie Rowe, right? Mother, wife just a normal person living her life. And you'll see that pattern again. A lot of these people are parents and have partners and they are, you know, in the LDS church. And I think there's a a sort of um, concept where it's like oppressive almost. Like I'm a mother, I'm a wife, I'm in the LDS church. I can't drink, I can't smoke, I can't swear, I can't do any, like, and it's very oppressive. And so you're almost like looking for an outlet. Like Lori would go into the church room and dance all night. You know, you're looking for an outlet to just be human, to just be almost not civilized in a way, to just kind of like, I don't know, be. And what I think we we have here is, because I was reading, and I didn't get on that avowal message board because I was like, I ain't paying, it was like 70 bucks or something. I was like, I ain't paying that shit. But I did read some Reddit forums of people who were on it and they would like take screenshots and stuff. And a lot of the people responding were like, okay, this is not the LDS church. Like what this is, is people that are just trying to feel special. People that are trying to feel like they're exempt from everything else that humans have to go through. Oh, we hear visions. We've been chosen by God for this special mission. I call it the Harry Potter syndrome, right? You look like a normal person. People are pushing you around. You're sleeping under the goddamn stairs. Nobody respects you, but you're special. They just don't know it yet. You know, they just don't know it. But one day they freaking will and they'll wish they didn't make you sleep under those damn stairs. I call it the Harry Potter syndrome. Like this is what happens. People need, they feel so unseen. They feel so pushed to the side. They feel so aimless. They need something to believe in and to be a part of. And in my opinion, that's exactly what you're going to see with Chad Daybell. With Lori, I don't know what the hell happened to her. Man. <laughs> like I, I couldn't tell you why she would fall for something like this because she seems to always be in control. I think there's mental illness that stems throughout Lori's family that made her susceptible to this. Whereas Chad Daybell, I think he had low self-esteem. He felt inadequate. And this made him feel special and like valued by people. They were listening to him. And he's like, oh, shit, let me keep saying the same crazy stuff because people are giving me respect. And I've always felt like I deserved this respect. So it's a very like complicated psychological, you know, chaotic like web that it, there's not one reason that people kind of find themselves in these positions is what I'm trying to say, I guess. Long story short. No, I, I agree. And we're talking more macro, like a whole cult, right? And of I think course, we're going to yeah. get there. But I think just as it pertains specifically, like you said, to Lori and more importantly, the, the other, the significant others in her life mm -hmm. on, on, a, on a more specific level on, a, on right at the, the, the heart of it, she's able to manipulate or be malleable to whatever she identifies that the person she's tr targeting is looking for. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. like you said, we're going to talk about Chad Dable tonight. So as crazy as she is, right, for all her flaws. There is something about her that she's very good at at understanding who the target is 
and how to and how to get them and there's how to become that that whatever they need whatever they need yeah and that is a super valuable uh, manipulative technique but super it's like salespeople do that right right? i mean look look at what she's done as far as some of the things she was able to accomplish right obviously miss usa or mrs usa i know you went back and forth is it mrs usa or miss usa mrs yeah mrs usa right yeah so mrs usa again being what the judges want, understanding what they're looking for and becoming that. Mm-hmm. Even Wheel of Fortune, as far as casting is concerned. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, know, for sure. I, you know, understanding what they're looking for, answering the questions and the way they need you to answer for you to put you on the show and looking a certain way. Yo, she was an extra on Modern Family. Like right. she got she got herself on Modern Family, you know, right. like so she knew she knows how to play the game. She knows and, how to play the game. And it's not just professional. And if you think about it, too, like she was able to find all of these successful men who were like wealthy and, you know, what I guess the the red pill community would call high value men Mm. (laughs) in today's terminology. And she was able to even as she was getting older, even though she already had kids from all these other relationships, able to get them to fall in love with her, marry her and and give her anything she wanted. Right. Right. And that's pretty valuable. Yeah, it definitely is something that can be good, be used for good and evil. Imagine right? what she could have done if she channeled that towards that, that, something that's, positive. That's what I'm saying. I mean, there are people out there in all lines of work who have similar skill sets and are able to use it for positive things and promote businesses, et cetera. But she obviously went a different route. She did. And in July of 2018, Lori took her daughter, Ty Lee, back to Kauai to visit her friend, Lori's friend, April Raymond. And April hadn't seen Lori in 14 months. So April was easily able to immediately see a change in her old friend because she wasn't seeing her every day. So it was like a drastic difference between that past year and how Lori was behaving now. April said, quote, this was my first taste with some of her crazy beliefs. She told me she had seen Jesus Christ face to face. It kind of got shut out pretty quickly because it wasn't something I wanted to explore. End quote. April also said that Lori spoke a lot about a new author she'd been reading, a man named Chad Daybell from Idaho. And April described the way Lori spoke about Chad kind of like the way a super fan would talk about their favorite pop star. Kind of like she said, like a fan girl, you know, like, oh, my God, she's enamored with Chad. Like, she needs to meet this man. She she thinks that if she meets this man, she will find, finally, her spiritual equal on Earth. In October of 2018, Lori attended an evening class at the LDS building in Gilbert, Arizona. And this was a class that was intended to help people prepare for the end times. This was a class run by Mother of Three and LDS author Melanie Gibb. And Melanie, once again, normal person, part of the LDS church. She's got kids. She's married to a chiropractor in Gilbert, Arizona. And she was about to publish her first book called Feel the Fire with Chad Daybell's publishing company. So after the meeting, Melanie and Lori chatted and Lori talked about some of her own personal spiritual experiences. And when she found out that Melanie had this direct connection to Chad Daybell, Lori decided all of a sudden like, all right, me and Melanie are going to be best friends. Like she has something I need. And Lori said she felt that the other side had delivered Melanie to her because she was supposed to meet Chad. She was supposed to be in his life and he was supposed to be in her life. And Melanie was like this bridge from Lori to Chad. Melanie said that she and Lori hit it off immediately, which is funny because I don't think they did. Right. (laughs) She said, oh, we had all the same feelings and we liked the same things. And like, I don't think she did. Like you said, I think Lori read her and said, what will make this woman trust me? What will make this woman believe that I am like her, and how can I get her to introduce me to Chad Daybell? I'm going to just be exactly what she needs. And uh, Melanie and Lori began to spend a lot of time together, and Lori even had Melanie to her home often. She introduced her to the family. Melanie said that JJ seemed like he was a handful for Lori, which is different than what everybody has always said, that Lori was such a good mother, so attentive, so patient. But by 2018, by the summer of 2018, Lori's patience with JJ is running out, and we can tell. Also, interestingly enough, because everybody had always said that Lori was a good mother and her and Tylee had such a close relationship, but Melanie Gibbs said that it seemed that that Lori and Tylee did not have such a great relationship. Tylee was often short or rude to Lori. And at this point, Lori is kind of acting a little unhinged and Tylee's relationship with Lori is becoming a little bit strained. Even though in July of 2018, Tylee did post on, I think, her Instagram and she said something, it was like a picture of Lori by the pool and she said, so lucky to have this person as my mother. Like I look up to her so much. So it was probably like a normal teenage relationship with her mother. She didn't realize how off the rails Lori had gotten. 
And she was probably just annoyed with her in general, as teenage girls usually are with their mothers. Melanie also said that Charles Vallow attempted to speak deeply about the kind of stuff that she and Lori would discuss in great depth, like the second coming and near-death experiences. But she could sense that there was underlying tensions between Lori and her husband, and it seemed like Lori was often impatient and frustrated with Charles, and she seemed to disapprove of him. Now, at this time, Charles was working a lot, and he was traveling often, so he didn't seem to see the change in Lori at first, but others did. Lori's brother, Adam Cox, claimed that at this time, Lori was obsessed about Christ coming back to Earth, and she was actively preparing for it, like buying cans of food and dried goods and toilet paper, you know, kind of like early on in the pandemic, everyone was buying those things. And even Ty Lee and Colby had noticed, with Colby saying, quote, I can't tell you how many times me and Ty Lee talked about it specifically, and we were like, do you not feel off about this? Does this not seem weird? Like the way mom acts and the way her and Melanie would get into a conversation and they would just slip away and keep talking. I was excited for her in a sense because she hadn't had friends for so long. I even told her one time, I'm so proud of you. Like, go have fun. Go find some mom friends. That's awesome. I didn't know there was a group. I didn't know she was leading something. I had no idea she was involved in any type of group, end quote. It's interesting that Colby says she's leading something, right? Because once again, a lot of people will say Chad was leading something, but I think once Lori came into Chad's life, he was the weaker personality, the one with the low self-esteem, and she did take the reins. If you ask my opinion, that's what I think. And Lori's mother, Janice, she said, you know, we thought that Lori was hanging out with some odd ducks, you know, basically some like people that were kind of off and like a little strange. But Lori seemed happy, so nobody really pushed the issue. We're going to take a quick break and then we'll be right back. If you've listened to the show before, you've probably heard us talk about Simply Safe, and you know they were named Best Home Security of 2023 by U.S. News and World Report. So they're probably resting on their laurels, right? Nope, definitely not. They're always innovating, always working on the next thing to help keep you and your loved ones safe 24-7, like their new 2-in-1 smoke and CO detector. It's next-generation hazard detection that distinguishes between fire and cooking smoke, so your home is protected and you get fewer false alarms. And let me tell you honestly this has been a game changer for me because we always are setting off or we always were setting off the smoke detector with cooking smoke and my dogs all literally have PTSD from this now where every time they hear the oven and they hear sizzling on the stove they get freaked out and they like pull up to me and they're shivering because they're afraid the alarm's gonna go off so hopefully after a little bit longer of having the two-in-one smoke and CO detector from Simply Safe we will retrain the dogs to not be terrified every time we cook a steak on the stovetop. Their new smoke and CO detector sensor joins Simply Safe's comprehensive suite of advanced security cameras, sensors, and hazard detectors for seamless whole home monitoring. And with Simply Safe's 24-7 professional monitoring service, trained agents stand ready to respond in an emergency dispatching police, firefighters, or EMTs to your door, even if you're away or you can't be reached. Monitoring service costs under $1 a day. Totally worth it. And Simply Safe is easy to set up yourself, or you can have a certified technician install it for you. And there's no reason to wait. With financing through a firm, you can secure your home today and pay overtime in installments that fit your budget. This is all great. We love Simply Safe here, and you know we are all about home and personal security. So if you want to try Simply Safe out for yourself, Derek's going to let you know how, and we have a great deal for you. We do have a great deal. And, and real quickly before we get into it, we talk a lot about cases and things we can do to better protect ourselves. A security system, in my opinion, is a must. If you don't have one, please get one. It can serve as a, a form of going back and seeing what was done, whether it's property damage or something like that. And it can also serve as a preventative measure for someone who may be casing the area looking for a house to rob. So Right now, get 20% off a new system when you sign up for interactive monitoring. Visit simplysafe.com slash crime weekly. That's simplysafe.com slash crime weekly. There's no safe like Simply Safe. On October 19th, 2018, Melanie invited Lori to her home for a small gathering of preparing a people followers. Now, preparing a people or PAP, because <laughs> that's easier than saying preparing a people a million times. PAP was an organization that is going to be very important going forward. They put on a series of lectures and events designed to prepare the people of this earth for the second coming of Jesus Christ. And they have like 
conferences. They got like podcasts, a website, all sorts of resources, things like that. Now, the LDS church has come out and said this group is not affiliated with them in any way. The church never endorsed them. Church leaders never spoke at preparing a people events. And the group was founded by some church members on their own initiative for their own purposes without any church involvement. That's what the LDS church says. And I mean, honestly, like, I, I believe them. It's fine. It, it's like people from the church started this offshoot group sort of like as a way to come together and bring people together. And I have I have no doubt that the the mainstream LDS church wasn't completely like supportive of it, because according to this official church statement, uh, preparing a people's teachings were on the fringe of church beliefs and sometimes an outright violation of church teachings. And several PAP leaders have since been excommunicated. This statement goes on to talk about the fact that preparing a people focuses on sensationalism rather than doctrine, stating, quote, preparing a people often focused on dreams and visions, inviting speakers like Daybell to talk about their supposed visions or holding workshops to help participants receive their own visions. The church does believe in revelation. However, it is unseemly at best and priestcraft or manipulation at worst to pay or charge money for a workshop to develop one's visionary skill. And the scriptures are clear that only the prophets can receive revelation that interprets the scripture or predicts the future for the entire church. One's own revelation is only applicable to oneself. Preparing a people was out of line in promoting individual visions as necessary to prepare for the second coming, end quote. Okay, listen, I loved the show Big Love. <laughs> Watched it religiously. Bill Paxton, his best work. I remember in, um, and because, I don't know, do you know what Big Love is? No, I do not. I was like, oh, okay, maybe I should know the show, but I don't. You should watch it. It's awesome. So Big Love mm, is like, okay. it's this guy, this Mormon guy living in Utah, and he has three wives and just like a bunch of children, right? But he's also like the owner of a sort of Home Depot-like, it's called Henriksen's Plus. I, I know way too much about this. Like, it's called, Hen it's like a, 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 you know, like a Home Depot type store and he's got like a bunch of chains and, you know, he's got, he wants to open more stores and he's focused on this like family values, like Mormon thing, but not like polygamy because it's illegal. So he has to hide his wives. He has to only have one public wife. And he has all his other wives like on the side and they like have separate houses that are all next to each other. But they like go back and forth and crazy. And like, honestly, if any guy ever thought like, oh, I want more than one girlfriend or I want more than one wife, you all need to watch this and see how distressed Bill is all the damn time. Because they, these wives are like arguing over who he's got to sleep with that night and who he's going to which kids he's taken. It's, it's terrible. That sounds horrible horrible <laughs> girls fighting oh that's terrible no it's not girls fighting it's like we need you we need you to do this we need you to do not like sleep with them like sex like oh who are you like attending to tonight like whose house are you gonna be in who are you helping put their kids to bed and like basically all your responsibilities as a father and a husband times it by three and then just have a heart attack but bill always be having these visions right he'll be like oh should i open a second store or is it not the right time? And then he'll be like, let me pray on this. And then he'll have like a revelation, they call it, which is he hears a spirit guide or something in his head telling him what the right thing is to do. And so what the LDS church is saying here is like, yeah, we believe in revelations for like your own personal life and your own personal choices. But as far as like, oh, hey, we see the world is ending and there's going to be a flood and everybody has to do this. That's not legitimate. Like you do not speak for the entire church and the entire like LDS population. And you can't predict things for the entire LDS population. But Chad Daybell's big on these visions, man. Chad Daybell and Julie Rowe and Melanie Gibb and Lori, we've already heard her talk about these visions and how her sister's speaking to her. They are big on this stuff because they want to feel special and unique and set apart. So what happened here and how PAP kind of started is it looks like the preparing a people members would recruit other people during their regular mainstream church because they were still going to like the LDS temples and stuff. But their beliefs were not regular or mainstream. For instance, one woman who moved to eastern Idaho in 2015 remembered being approached by a man in her new LDS congregation. And he told her that he had been spiritually prompted to offer her a job. Like he saw her and he heard a voice in his head say, 
give this woman a job. So he goes up and he's like, you're working for me now. And according to East Idaho News, quote, she found her new boss had beliefs that were different than what is typically taught in the church. Latter-day Saints believe God gives people spiritual gifts to help them serve others. The man who hired her took this belief to an extreme. He claimed to have power to see spirits and cast out evil spirits from people in his home who were supposedly struggling with evil spirits inside of them. And he would claim to cast the spirits out. End quote. This man reportedly had people coming from all over to be healed by him, right? And he kind of made it seem as if he helped this woman who now worked for him with her health issues. Like she had thyroid issues and high blood sugar and celiac disease. And he was like preying on her and he's like, you're healed. And this woman actually felt healed. And so she stopped taking her medication, started eating gluten again. And then obviously in a few years, she realized like that was a bad idea. But this guy applied this to everything. If the computer wasn't working or the printer wasn't connecting, he would use his spiritual powers to fix these things. And if he couldn't fix them with his spiritual powers, then he was like, oh, this is due to like dark spirits interfering. They're blocking me. from fixing the printer. So this woman said that her boss brought her to a Preparing the People conference, and he introduced her to Julie Rowe and Chad Daybell, two people who were apparently idolized in in a lot of these LDS circles for their close connection to the spirit world due to their near-death experiences. Chad Daybell, Julie Rowe, and Melanie Gibb were all Preparing a People followers and active and invested in the PAP events and the online community and the podcast. So Chad had been on the podcast. uh, Julie Rowe obviously been on the podcast. Melanie Gibb on the podcast. So they got their own little like circle going on here. And then Lori meets Melanie Gibb and she finds out that she knows Chad Daybell. And suddenly Lori's being pulled into this preparing a people kind of cult, (laughs) yeah, cult-like thing. So just just to confirm, because I'm writing this down, I'm actually typing some notes. Preparing a people, we looked that up. That is a cult that was mainly started by or a group started by by Lori. That's the way that's. No, the preparing a people was started by. We're going to talk a little bit more towards the end, but a husband and wife team from Utah, Spring Springville, Utah, the same place where where Chad Daybell grew up. So this was, but this was the the group that Lori was in. This, this is, is the pre- group that Lori found herself in, which allowed her to have access to Chad Daybell. Yes. So she didn't start it, but this was the conduit in which got her exposed to Chad Daybell. Okay, got it. Preparing a people. Yeah. Okay, got it. So during this small preparing a people group meeting at Melanie's house, Lori spoke openly and freely about some of her experiences, her relationships, her visions from the other side, and the missions she'd been hand chosen by God to participate in exactly what that that mission is, we will talk about soon. But according to Lori, she'd been surprised to have been chosen because (laughs) her whole life, she she had thought she was just totally sweet and innocent. That's what Lori said. She's like, I don't understand. Like, I'm just a sweet, innocent little girl. Why Why is God choosing me to be like a warrior for him? But God was able to convince her that she was a warrior. She said, quote, and he gave me a pre-mortal memory of me, and I got to see myself as a warrior, fighting for the Savior in the pre-mortal world. And I went to other worlds, and I fought, and I was one of his strongest warriors, and I saw it. I was not sweet, and I was not innocent. I am old. I have fought in this war for millennia, and that's who I am. And I came down here to be a warrior and fight. And I only thought that I was sweet and innocent, end quote. Yeah, and nobody's under any, like, illusions that you're sweet and innocent, Lori. No one. (laughs) No one who's met you, at least. Now, according to Lori, everyone who dies, it's not like they're dying and it's a bad thing, right? They're dying because it's part of their mission. And then they go to the other side. And to follow that note, she also has some thoughts on children, saying, quote, Your kids are adults in eternity. They're your friends. They're loaned to you for this short time. They are adults, and they have their own mission and their own eternity to live. We do not need to worry about the souls of our children, end quote. And if that isn't some, like, foreshadowing, I don't know what is. Besides Lori saying that she was on the verge of a mental breakdown when she was in the Mrs. USA pageant. I mean, there were signs. I can't say that it was you know obvious. I, mean, I don't think people would make the jump of her saying that to, to where we are now. And it's so interesting because there's so many cases like this where people say things, but they don't really mean it. Overall, I would say there are always things we can do better. 
and we're, we're we're early in this story, but I'm looking for a moment where it would be obvious to most people that this is what she was capable of, an incident or something like that. I don't know if that's going to come or not, but to well, be do fair- you think, Do you think her telling people like, oh, I'm so afraid of the end times that sometimes I feel like it's better to just put myself and my kids in a car and drive off a bridge? Do you think that might be like, uh, you know, kind yes. of a weird thing to say? Yeah. I do. I do. I do. And I think that is something where- Sometimes people say things that are really, really stupid. And I think we've all met someone who in a moment of weakness says something along the lines of, I'm going to kill myself. I can't take it anymore. And most of the time, they don't truly mean it. It's just something they say in the heat of the moment and it's not something they carry through with. But there are those occasions where people say something like that and their family members or friends do not take them seriously and they end up doing it. And then the, the family members are left with that guilt for not acting on it. So it's a really fine line between is this person just saying this because they're upset or are they saying it because they're truly intending or, or contemplating doing it? Yeah, and that's, you don't know. You, you don't know. And that's why with this case, my curiosity is being drawn to the idea of, okay, I can see that from a religious standpoint, this woman is someone you'd want to be cautious of, right? The, her beliefs and what, what she thinks and I wouldn't necessarily be around it, but considering what Lori did to her children, I'm following along with the viewers and the listeners of this story to see if there was a moment where I would have liked to think that I would have said, oh God, these kids are not safe here. You know, these kids are not in a position where they should have been in the home anymore. And it's always tough to identify that point if you truly believe it, because then you you think about what could have been done. And I don't know if we're going to have that in the story. I truly don't know where you're going with this, but that's just so you guys know where my mindset is. I'm looking to see, like, as I'm making these notes for everyone who's on YouTube, you can see here, two pages of them. Oh, peepers are falling out. I'm a Yo, mess. So, Derek, next episode is going to blow your mind. It's going to get crazy because we're well, going to hey, talk. That's a, great, that's a great foreshadowing. Way to, way to plug it. <laughs> we're going to talk you. about, because <laughs> you were like, I don't know if anything like that happened in this case. Hell yes. Okay. okay. So, first of all, we're going to talk about... <laughs> I won't get too far off the path then, but you just so you know where I'm coming from, you, yeah. Stephanie, and then everyone listen. like, I'm always looking at it from like the preventative side of things. Like, I guess that's the cop in me. Like, could there have been something that we could have stopped this? We, we, so that Stephanie and I, we're not covering it here today. Right. And, and that's the thing that I'm trying to see if there's that moment. Cause in some cases there isn't, in some cases, it's just a s- series of un- uh, unfortunate circumstances where everyone is shocked by what happens. Well, and, I mean, I think you can be shocked by what happens and also like have some hindsight and be like, yeah, I see how I see how this happened, right? So let me ask you this. And again, I know we're going off here. Would you agree if I said to you, because without knowing the rest of this case, although I can't stand the guy, Christopher Watts was a little bit more of a surprise. Yes. yes. It, it was something where there was obviously troubles in the relationship, but there was nothing when we covered that case and we covered it really early on. I wish we had covered it when you and I found our groove. Right. But, and we kind of rushed it almost because we were trying to find out duration. We were still with like just a simple podcast. That's the- right. That we could have done so much more with that. But I feel like with that one, there wasn't this moment where you're like, oh man, they, they got to get, it. he just went from zero to a hundred. From what we see and what, from we, what know. we see, from what yeah. we know, what's documented. Yeah. Right. We're here. There's a lot of documentation that red flag, red flag, red, red flag, you know, so to the point where like you can tell it's it's some like juncture or junction, whatever. Lori became so not self-aware that she wasn't even trying to hide this crazy shit anymore. You know, there's mm. so much documentation where it's like, <laughs> what? Like, OK, so I think. Maybe me joking, I would say something like, oh, I'm really afraid of the apocalypse. I'm going to like drive my, I'd rather just drive myself and my kids off a bridge, like joking. But if you combine that with being deeply religious, right, believing that the end times are an actual thing, buying a crap load of food and supplies to like prepare for this actual end time that you think is happening, because that takes an investment time, a time, like in a time investment, as well as a money investment. You know, you're not just like doing it for no reason. All of those things combined might make me worried about a person saying that rather than like a non-religious person who isn't like filling their garage with cans of peas 
and, you know, getting a bunker ready for the end times. When you have all of those things in combination and you're talking about like being face to face with Jesus Christ. Yeah, I, I would start to be concerned at that point. Like, I think a lot of people missed it. And I think that there's a lot of like negligence on the people around Lori where I think they were just like, we don't even want to be around. Like her friend April Raymond was like, I didn't want to talk about it because I didn't want to entertain that stuff. I don't want to talk about that stuff. You know, you kind of just like sweep it under the rug. Like, let's pretend she didn't say that crazy shit. No, I'm hearing what you're saying. And in totality, I, I agree with you. You know, it's definitely more that can be done. And I, mean, I, I, I will give someone the benefit of the doubt where it's like they might get one piece where someone mm -hmm. gets the other mm -hmm. and you're yeah. still working on it. But yeah, from when we're looking at it, from the outside looking in now where we kind of have a complete picture, yeah, I'm with you. The totality of everything that's going on, the way she kind of processes things, how deeply she invests into something once she buys into it. Yeah, those are things you got to, when she says something like that, Knowing Lori Vallow like you would at this point, she when she says something, she's going to do it. Mm -hmm. You know, she's she's going she she's she's contemplating it. She's thinking about it. Yeah, and next episode we're going to talk about um, Charles Vallow when he files for divorce. The things he says in in his you know when he files for divorce, you know, you write why you want to get divorced, and the things he says, he was trying to do something. He was trying to draw people's attention to what was going on with Lori, and you'll see that like the sh the shit she was doing and saying to him was bananas like there there was a point where it was very obvious that this woman was not in her right mind and it just doesn't seem like anybody did anything and nobody was there to help Charles and it's very unfortunate because nobody really like believed him or helped him and we're also going to talk about Chad's crazy ass and how he was like writing this like fan fiction about Lori from the moment he met her and like I knew she was the one and I trembled to kiss her like yeah there's signs man that these two people are off their rockers and nobody really pays attention. So the following week after this little meeting at Melanie's house, Lori and Melanie drove together to St. George, Utah to attend a Preparing a People conference in person where, of course, Chad Daybell was scheduled as a guest speaker. Now let's talk about Chad Daybell. According to his biography, Living on the Edge of Heaven, which I had to read, by the way, unfortunately, he can trace his ancestry all the way back to Finity Daybell, who lived in England during the 1840s. Finity and his wife Mary were devout members of the LDS Church, and in May of 1864, Finity moved his family to Salt Lake City, Utah, and settled on a little farm in the Heber Valley. Finity's descendants would come to be respected citizens and leading members of the LDS community and church. Now, Keith Daybell was Chad's grandfather, and he grew up in Provo, Utah in the 1930s during the Great Depression. Keith met his wife, Rosalie, at the Springville High Junior Prom. They opened up a Texaco station and had two sons, Ray and Lanny. And in 1944, Keith was drafted to fight in World War II, and he was sent to the Western Front, where he would be taken as a POW, prisoner of war, by German soldiers. Three months later, Rosalie received a letter from her husband telling her that he was alive and being held at a German prison outside of Frankfurt. Now, Keith would eventually be liberated by Russian soldiers on May 20th, 1945, and he would be awarded two Purple Hearts for heroism. After the war, Keith joined his two brothers in building the Daybell Lumber Company. And in 1947, Keith and Rosalie had another son that they would name Jack, and Jack would become Chad Daybell's father. So Keith Daybell died in a work accident in 1955 at the age of 32. I can't believe he did all of that by the time he was 32. Like he fought in a war. He was a POW. He started a lumber company. He had three kids. Most people, most men, by the time they'd be 32 today, barely can get off their PlayStation. It's a damn shame. <laughs> Not you, Derek. I mean, I don't. I Listen, I have a PlayStation. I wish I had time to play it, but I don't. But isn't that crazy? Like, man fought in a war, was taken prisoner, spent time in a POW camp, had three kids, you know, had a farm, built a lumber company in 32, before he's 32. Like, that's just bananas to me. Impressive man. So Keith Daybell would be buried at the spring. Yeah, an impressive man who I'm sure would be ashamed, ashamed of what his grandson, Chad Daybell, is up to and with a kind of like pathetic excuse for an empty shell of a man that Chad Daybell would become. But nice. anyways, Keith was buried at the Springville Cemetery and his wife Rosalie had herself sealed to him in a temple so they would be together for all eternity. And then she had the children sealed to both herself and Keith. So for those of you who don't know, in the LDS faith, they believe that civil marriages end at death. But if you're sealed together in a temple, 
that's for forever. Like, so in the afterlife, you'll be with your husband and your children forever and ever. And, you know, if it was like back in the day and you were still practicing plural marriage, it would be you if you were the man and like 12 of your wives and all 500 of your children together forever in eternity, which, <laughs> damn, that sounds pretty miserable. Sounds amazing. <laughs> Not amazing. <laughs> like the fights don't even stop at death, okay? Mm-hmm. <laughs> the fights don't stop. So um, Rosalie's son, Jack Daybell, also went to Springville High School where he met Sheila Chestnut. After high school, Jack attended BYU, Brigham Young University, where uh, many Mormons end up going to college. And he was planning on serving a mission after college, but then he was called to service in the Navy for the Vietnam War. Before being shipped out, Jack and Sheila got married in 1967, and she went to live with him at the U.S. Naval Base outside of San Diego, California. On August 11th, 1968, Chad Guy Daybell was brought into the world. Even though they were living in California, they wanted him to be born in Utah. So his father, Jack, purposely planned his shore leave, his two weeks of shore leave, around Chad's due date to make sure that Chad would be born in Provo, Utah. And after being born, Chad was brought back to California, where he and his mother lived for a year in a National City apartment. National City is, like, outside of San Diego. After he was done with his Navy service, Jack moved his family back to Springville and began to work as an electrician for Geneva Steel. In his biography, Chad claimed that his father Jack heard voices and received messages from the other side as well. For instance, one day his route was going to bring him through some underground tunnel, and as he was about to enter the tunnel, he heard a voice warning him, to not enter that tunnel, and then 15 minutes later, the tunnel collapsed. So Jack felt that the voice had belonged to his father, Keith, and that Keith was guiding him from beyond the grave. Chad also claims that his first encounter with death was in the third grade, when his classmate Randy was killed during a cave collapse. And Chad said that this was very impactful for him because he was told that Randy was in heaven, but he didn't know what that meant. So death became a very scary subject to him. This is crazy to me because this is the only time in his autobiography or his biography that Chad ever mentions a negative feeling towards death. Otherwise, he seems to be fascinated by the subject of death and death in general. Chad loved to read, especially scary stuff and mysteries, everything from Alfred Hitchcock to the Hardy Boys. And in fourth grade, he wrote his first book called The Murder of Dr. J and His Assistant. Because Chad's really afraid of death. (laughs) He's writing books about it. And in his biography, Chad says, quote, My teacher, Mr. Bushman, really liked it. And he had a school employee type it up. It was a fun story, despite the gruesome title. And they put it in the school library so my friends could check it out to read. End quote. Chad stated that by the time he was in the eighth grade, he was mad at the world. He wasn't having a great time. He said he felt like he had no friends and he'd become the target of a bully in woodshop class. And this bully would punch him in the back every time his teacher's back was turned. Chad said, quote, I finally told my teacher what was happening and he moved the kid away from me, but my self-esteem was pretty low. End quote. In my opinion, Chad's self-esteem will remain low throughout his entire life. When he was 13, oh my God, this story pisses me off, by the way, to no end. When he was 13, Chad was walking home from school through Memorial Park when he happened upon an innocent honeybee buzzing around, pollinating flowers, doing its thing, minding its own damn business. And Chad was like, I can't have you doing that. I can't have you minding your own business and doing the thing that keeps all of us alive. Chad said, quote, I peered at it for a moment, then smashed it with my shoe. I spotted another one, then another one. I got a strange satisfaction from it. I kept count. And after about a half hour, I had killed 120 bees. Then as I was about to step on another bee, a masculine voice shouted in my ear, hey, stop it. Leave them alone. I jumped back and looked around, but there wasn't anyone in sight. I was really shook up because the man had sounded really angry. I walked in a circle for a minute, trying to make sense of it. Finally, I realized that maybe an angel was fed up with me, killing God's innocent creatures. That incident helped me realize how pathetic I had become, and I decided to start making some better choices. End quote. Okay. Dude's a psychopath. Dude's a psychopath. Like, who does that? Yeah, that's a problem. That's a problem. (sighs) For sure. I know, like, some people don't mind killing bugs and stuff, but I do. I won't. Like, you'll find me chasing a damn fly around my house for an hour trying to, like, shoo it outside. I just, I don't, I I can't do it, right? So, like, and and especially honeybees, like, who are the most innocent, helpful 
creatures on Earth. It's the fact that he he kept count and kept killing them and he got to 120 and you have feel no remorse about this as you're doing it. It blows my mind. Like to me, that's the biggest red flag of anything I've ever seen. Because it, it, some people don't value the life of insects or whatever, but like it's still life that, that is their one life and you're just taking it from them mercilessly for no reason other than you can because you're bigger and stronger. And, you know, we know that he was a part of killing JJ and Tylee, two individuals who were not as big and not as strong as he was. So clearly this is not a big deal for him. Yeah, the whole situation's tough. And, and I will say this goes back to what we were talking about a little while ago because as you mentioned, you could have a little kid kill a bee or something like that. And it's not a sign that they're going to be a serial killer. That's not what we're saying here. But the way he's describing it, how he was viewing what he was doing, it wasn't as simple as I'm just killing this bug because I don't like it or whatever. It was more to it. It was deeper than that. Anger. Um, yeah. And, and there's something to be said for that. And it is a sign of thing, something, you know, things to come in the future. So here it did mean something. It's one of those situations I would say that you are kind of faced with a tough role of like not knowing until it's too late maybe here because what are you going to do, commit a kid for killing a bee? There's no really way to know what he was feeling internally when he did it. I think most parents or whoever's seeing this would see it and just think it's a young kid being stupid. Um, so I don't know I don't know what we could pick up on from on that when, again, what he's describing is something he was feeling inside of himself, maybe not something he was necessarily vocalizing. So how would you know unless you're sitting down with this kid on a couch and he's telling you this this way where you could say, well, there's more here than just the killing of a bee, you know? So I don't know. I don't know. It's You always want to call out opportunities to, to grab someone and get them off, uh, you know, away from society before they do something bad. I don't know how you do oh, yeah, that the, here. The random voice did. The random voice in his head. Mm. And it's concerning to me. Like, if he's serious and he's actually hearing voices like this and he's 13 and he's like, is he schizophrenic? Like, was he just undiagnosed schizophrenic? Like, is he actually hearing voices? Because this is a constant theme for him throughout. Or is this just something in hindsight when he's adult, he's making up these stories? Either way, kind of like psychopathic, right? Not not the best sign not of good. like especially, a healthy person. No, especially what we know now. Yeah, exactly. It, it did kind of seem like, at least the way Chad puts it in his book, that this revelation was what made him focus more on religion than he had before. He said he had never been yelled at by an unseen voice before, and he didn't want it to happen again. So he started setting some goals for himself, including reading the Book of Mormon. And in the ninth grade, while he was reading this book, Chad claims he had a spiritual awakening that made him cry with joy. Throughout high school, Chad kept really good grades. He was on the honor roll every year, and he played on the football team along with Scott Mitchell, who would one day be the quarterback for the Miami Dolphins. During the summer between his junior and senior year, Chad got a job digging graves at the cemetery. And throughout his life, Chad would come back to work at this cemetery and other cemeteries over and over again, literally. Like for the next 20 years, whenever he has a break in jobs or he's home from school, He's working and he's digging graves at the cemetery. And he would even end up writing a book about his experiences called One Foot in the Grave. In fact, he would be working at a cemetery as a sexton, which is the person who maintains church property, including the graveyard, when he met his future wife, Tammy Daybell. So in 2001, Chad told the Desiree News that although it was a physically demanding job digging graves, it was also a rewarding one. And he would come up with some of his best ideas for stories while sitting amongst the headstones. He said that one time he'd been digging a fresh grave next to a plot that was known to be haunted. And he said, quote, as I hit the vault of the haunted grave. I just felt a real jolt go through me, like electricity, and I felt a presence there. I just took off running, and I didn't even look back, but I could feel it on my tail, end quote. Now, in fairness, because you're someone who reads a lot of books, I will also say this could be an, an, a biography for someone who turned out to be brilliant and a great storyteller and didn't do all these side things. Would you agree with that at least? Not the bee killing thing, no. No, not the bee killing okay, thing. Okay, well, the bee killing thing like, along with the grave digger thing is concerning. Okay. <laughs> But you, right? you follow what I'm saying, though? I mean, I, I can't judge. I love hanging out in cemeteries. I'm not you get what I'm saying? Like, I think yeah. there's something, but it's, we're having a lot of like coming back to what we said earlier, which isn't planned. It just happens. But in totality, put it all together and it doesn't sound great. But there are s separate things here where you may look at it individually and say, well, that's not a big deal. I actually can see how someone who thinks differently would put themselves in that situation. It would allow them to be even more creative. So, yeah, I guess it's, uh, yeah trying to find ways to look at it and see it for what it is without defending anyone because I have no skin in the game for that. But really interesting set of circumstances. 
Yeah, I mean, like I said, the cemetery thing, whatever. I I completely get I, yeah, it. I could I definitely do see find, you doing that. I do, I do do that. I I mm. hang out in cemeteries, but I'm not digging graves, dude. Okay, so I think there's like a fine line, like. That would be disturbing to me. Like he told a story where he had to uh, they had buried a woman and then they forgot that she was still wearing her wedding ring and her husband wanted it back. So they had to like dig her up and get the wedding ring off of it. And right. he was like, oh, whatever, like not a big deal. He was like, oh, you know, it's kind of sad when you have to bury the kids. Like he would just say things like so weirdly. And like we know that he would end up burying two kids on his own property, like not long after this. So it's like, yes, I guess in hindsight, it's creepier that he was a grave digger because we know what happened. And I guess it's a job and somebody's somebody's got to do it, right? But it shouldn't have been Chad Daybell, who's like the murderer of honeybees. I don't know if that's Serial on the application, murder. though. Have you <laughs> How ever many honeybees have you murdered? Yeah, I don't know if that's something they, that they would pick up on. Stephanie, 120 Jesus. honeybees? I mean, you, got, you can't hide that's the murder of honeybees. <laughs> Too many honeybees, Chad. I'm so sorry. We we have to turn down your application. <laughs> God, my God. Whatever. The summer he worked as a grave digger, Chad also had his first near-death experience. Um, this is the year before his senior year of high school. And he claimed that this experience changed his life forever. He and his friends were jumping off cliffs and into the water below at the Flaming Gorge Reservoir. And Chad decided to jump off a 60-foot high cliff so that when he finally hit the water, it felt like he was hitting concrete. He writes in his book, quote, a shock went through my entire body and I saw a white flash of light. I felt an audible pop at the base of my skull and I thought, oh no, I broke my neck. I also wondered if I had cut my forehead open because there was a brief searing pain above my eyes. I quickly realized something even worse was happening. My spirit was partly out of my body. The best way to describe it is my physical body went deeper into the water than my spirit did. This caused my spirit to pop out through my head, but then it felt like my spirit's knees got stuck in my skull and didn't make it all the way out. During those few moments, I could see on the other side of the veil. I saw an endless white plain in all directions. There seemed to be a distinct horizon hundreds of miles in the distance. I also heard a deep, rich melody that sounded like a synthesizer. The pain I felt for a few moments earlier was gone. There was soothing warmth surrounding me, and I also felt tangible energy particles of knowledge rushing towards me in all directions. I just soaked it all in, end quote. So, I mean, good thing that his spirit's knees got stuck in his skull, or he might have died, you know? Good thing his spirit terrible. has big knees, yeah. That would have been, mm, I'll be nice. Uh, would have saved us a lot of trouble. <laughs> I'll be nice, but not really. <laughs> not really. <laughs> yeah. So uh, let's take a quick break, actually, because we're going to come back and talk about how Chad felt after this near death experience. Helix Sleep makes premium mattresses and bedding that are customized to fit your needs and conveniently shipped right to your front door or your back door, whatever door you use. It's been years now that I've been getting better quality sleep on my Helix Sleep mattress. And at this point, everybody in my house, all three of my kids and myself, we all have a Helix Sleep mattress and we're all getting better sleep. Everyone's different and Helix knows that. And that's why they made a sleep quiz that matches your unique body type and a sleep preference to the perfect mattress for you. So for example, uh, I'm a side sleeper and I like a firmer mattress and the sleep quiz paired me with the Midnight Lux mattress and my sleep has genuinely improved since then. I never get as much sleep as I want, which is something my mattress cannot control, but at least I know that on my Helix Sleep mattress, I'm going to get better quality sleep and I won't be tossing and turning and trying to find a comfortable position all night and I'll actually go into a deeper sleep quicker and it's just it's super comfortable. Honestly, at the end of the day, it's super comfortable and it supports me and it's sort of just cocoons me and I'm just very comfortable and I don't wake up with as much back pain as I used to. And I kind of always thought that like I just had back pain because I was getting older and that was just a, a fact of life, something I had to accept. But apparently it's not. I don't have to accept that and neither do you. Also, if you sleep with a partner, you can both take the quiz together and find a mattress that suits both of your unique sleep styles. You can personalize your mattress even further by adding the Glaciotex cooling cover, which will keep you cool and even more comfortable while you sleep. And with these upcoming summer months, I think you definitely should order one of these if you decide to go with your Helix Sleep mattress and purchasing your new Helix 
night's sleep mattress is so easy. Like I said, the quiz just takes a couple of minutes. You put in your order, your mattress ships right to your door with free shipping in the U.S., and it comes all rolled up in a box. You open it up, unroll it. It's very easy to set up, and Helix is going to give you a 100-night sleep trial so that you can make sure that you and your mattress are compatible. You should definitely always you know, sleep with something before bringing it home permanently. That's just the way I feel about it. Helix mattresses also include a 10-year warranty, and they offer financing options and flexible payment plans. We do really love our Helix mattresses in this family, and if you're looking for a new bed, we definitely think you should give Helix a try because we think that you'll love your Helix Sleep mattress as well. So Derek's going to let you know how you can try Helix Sleep out for yourself. Remember, you're going to get 100 nights to try it in your home risk-free so you have nothing to lose. That's right. And right now, Helix is offering 20% off all mattress orders and two free pillows for our listeners or our viewers, whoever you are. Uh, just go to helixsleep.com slash crimeweekly. This is their best offer yet, and it won't last long. With Helix, better sleep starts now. All right, we're back. So Chad Daybell said after this, after his um, spirits and ease got stuck in his skull, he was spiritually changed. He had glimpsed another dimension and it had, quote, felt like home, end quote. Chad said he had an infusion of spiritual energy around him. And now he had an interest in gospel topics like never before. And he just would read everything he could get his hands on. He would devour church-related books and scriptures, having a strong impression that he would need this information later on in life. He became very receptive at sensing disembodied spirits, as well as receiving direct promptings and impressions that would help keep him out of danger. Some spirit should have warned his ass to stay away from Lori Vallow is all I'm going to say. Clearly, your talent is not good enough that it's that it's that good at keeping you out of danger. It can warn you about a tunnel collapse, but not about a black widow creeping up on you. All right. Mm -hmm. So. He said um, he said that this whole like intuitive thing, it was a problem when he was dating a girl he really liked because he would always pray on whether or not the relationship should continue. You know, he'd go on a few dates. He'd be like, I really like this girl. And so he'd be like, hey, should I should I like get serious with this person and like pursue this relationship? And he said without fail, he would always hear a loud voice in his head say no. <laughs> and so he was like, I got to break up with her. Chad said he believed when he'd hit that water and his spirit left his body, his personal veil was ripped open near his forehead. That's why he felt that searing pain like Harry Potter. You know, whenever Voldemort's close by, Harry feels like his like scar just lighting up. That's Chad Daybell. And um, so his his veil was ripped open near his forehead and never sealed back up completely. He said, quote, to fulfill my mission in life, I needed a good shot to the head to tear my veil a little. And the angels finally orchestrated it. End quote. Chad Daybell would graduate from Springville High School and he would win a two year scholarship to BYU. But going away to college, even though Chad said he loved it and he felt comfortable there, from what I read in his biography, he did seem to feel kind of isolated and alone too. And he kind of has this throughout. He's a person that I feel like is socially awkward and shy. And he never feels like he has friends and he never feels like people look up to him or respect him or like, give him the respect he deserves. And he kind of just feels like isolated and alone. So he said he vividly remembered walking the campus during a snowstorm one January and thinking that not a soul on earth cared about what he was doing at that moment. I think that's very telling. This is something that that I think a lot of people, especially in the time of social media, feel this need to like project their lives to out. To be because, seen. To be seen, right? Um, so everything they're doing, everything they're eating, whatever movies they're they got to put it on social media because it's like, okay, it didn't happen if I if I don't like show everybody that it's happening. They're not content with just being alone and experiencing something in real time. They need to feel validated externally by someone or multiple someones and that that to me is a little a little concerning because it says like your self worth is not super high. It's not um it's not sustainable on its own. Well you think about it not to go on an extreme here, but you think about the school shooters and things like that where we have individuals where if you start to really look at these individuals before these incidences in many in situations they feel like they're not being seen or heard. They feel like they're walking amongst people and nobody notices them. And they're trying to find a way to get someone's attention. They're looking for that infamy at the end. And I feel like a lot of the times 
there's a lot more going on here. I'm scratching the surface of yeah. why these things happen. Like they don't so, care how they get it at this point. They're just looking to be seen or heard and they they feel like they've been ostracized by society. And this is one of the elements that we, f we are starting to find when they're looking into the psychology behind these mass shootings and what what's the motive for the killer. And I think that this is one of those elements. And so obviously Chad Daybell is not a school shooter, but that's kind of, I hate to even say this, but before his time where that's like a thing now, right? Like when someone wants to get attention in our country, unfortunately, this is the way they do it, where Chad chose a different path, which was instead of trying to get the attention of others, surrounding himself with people who he could manipulate into believing what he believed so that he would be the center of attention. He would be the person they would go to for advice. And so he, this is a yeah. sign of that to things to come. He doesn't feel like he can rest on his own laurels. You know, he doesn't feel like I am who I am and I'm pretty great and people right. will gravitate towards me. Mm -hmm. He felt like he had to kind of like Lori, like become what other people needed. It's sad. And I hate to sound like this like old person, like back in my day, you know, but like I think that we are seeing that now more and more. We're seeing things like your Brian Koberger's and these like insane acts. I mean, every every day I read like a husband has killed his wife and children uh, and then taken his own life. Every single day, there's another one of these. And it's just like this huge dramatic thing that like just doesn't need to happen. But I think it's because we have isolated ourselves so much. The social media has become so important and real life friendships and real life communications and real life community has become so unimportant and we're moving away from family values and we're moving away from community support and we're kind of like just depending on social media and these random faceless people to validate us. And when that doesn't happen and now we are so isolated from everyone in real life and you're not getting that like dopamine hit that you need every time you post a picture or a post on like Instagram or Facebook or whatever – you start to feel very depressed. You feel very depressed. And then you're like, what is the point? No one cares about what I'm doing. Kind of like Chad said, not a soul on this planet cares about what I'm doing right now. Ah, oh, man, tough situation to really kind of wrap your head around because I, I always, we always try to look for the signs, but sometimes if they're not voicing those concerns or their feelings, how would you know? And I feel like it's happening so much today, so, so much today that like it's hard oh to God. even look for the signs because it's just like everywhere you look. Absolutely. 1000%. That's that. That's the scary part. Is we've even talked about it with my kids being in school, the preventative measures. There's actually software and, and different things that now that they're implementing in the school systems for teachers to make note. And it could be something minor, but the system has an algorithm where one teacher may see one thing about student A, they they document it, and it doesn't raise any flags in the system. But then another teacher documents something about student A without even knowing about what else is in the system, and the combination of the two reports internally start to raise a flag for the algorithm to say, hey, flash, 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 someone may want to look at the student and talk to them because there's a combination of things happening now where- That's good. I mean, separately, I yeah, there's a whole, it's a very, the unfortunate thing is it's expensive for some of the software, but uh, Chris Mohandi has told me about it where there's actually systems that, and they're getting better every day, but systems where independently everyone can- put something into the system that may not rise to the level of some of discipline, but just something worth noting where this computer system has been developed by psychologists all around the world, where if the, there's a combination of things that are recognized, it will notify administrators to maybe have some type of intervention to try to prevent these tragic situations. I mean, it's just unfortunate that we have to have that, right? And then we can't oh, yeah, like I mean, be yeah. proactive and, you know, return to a time when people felt productive and needed in society. Like that's what's happening here. People feel like, where's my place here? I don't, I don't, I don't give it to anything. I, nobody cares about me. I'm not like a productive member of society. I have no purpose. Mm. And, and a person with no purpose can be a very dangerous person. Agreed. So Chad said things like, you know, he was taking classes with hundreds of students and he never sat next to the same person twice. And not only that, <laughs> He was being hounded by people in other realms. He said, quote, some of them were friendly spirits, while others were definitely dark souls. They never approached me, but I was able to discern they were people who had lived in the area many years earlier. For some reason, when they died, they didn't go to the light. They'd stayed behind on Earth and were now stuck in limbo. If they got too close to me, the hair on my head would stand on end. I tried to ignore them because if I acknowledged them, they seemed to hang around me a lot longer. I found it interesting that these spirits weren't congregated in cemeteries, abandoned buildings, or quiet areas. Most of the time, they were wherever there was a lot of human energy they could feed off of. I went to a high school basketball game that winter, and there were dozens of them in attendance. 
end quote. I mean, you think he'd be grateful for them because he's feeling so lonely. Mm. So Chad Daybell was assigned to complete his LDS mission in a place called Morristown, New Jersey, where he was assigned to spread the Mormon doctrine in some of the most poverty-stricken areas in New Jersey. And it was here, amongst the gray skies and abandoned buildings, that Chad claims he not only came face-to-face with dozens of disembodied spirits, but that's when he realized his torn veil could help him tell the difference between the good ones and the bad ones, a.k.a., for people who are familiar with this case and know what's to come, the dark and the light spirits. Chad also got closer to his grandfather, Keith Daybell, while he was in New Jersey, who he would find walking beside him one day as he went knocking on doors. Keith Daybell's going to pop up a bunch in Chad's life. He's going to be his main spirit guide. After two years of missionary work, Chad returned to BYU in 1989. But before the fall semester started, Chad was at home in Springville, flipping through his brother Paul's 1988 yearbook when he came across a half-page feature of a girl with short blonde hair named Tammy Douglas. Chad said that when he saw her face, he felt the most electrifying shock of his life. And he realized that she would have been a sophomore when he was a senior, but he didn't remember her. And he needed to find her, and he needed to meet her. So he asked his brother Paul if he knew where Tammy Douglas had ended up after she'd graduated the previous year. And Paul said he did. He said, easy. Tammy is the secretary for the Springville Parks Department. And the Parks Department of Springville also had purview over the city's cemeteries. And that's when Chad started working at the cemetery again. And Chad said he realized why he couldn't remember Tammy. He said his spiritual veil had been placed over his mind when it came to Tammy because it wasn't their time when they were in high school. He said that he knew if they'd met Too soon when they were in high school, they would have become inseparable and they still had things they needed to do and experience individually before becoming one. So basically, he'd probably seen her, maybe even met her and talked to her, but the veil had been placed so that he just wouldn't remember this and he wouldn't like get attached to her. So he finds her, he meets her, and after some brief courtship, Chad prayed and he asked if Tammy was the one he should marry. And finally, he got a yes. The voice said yes. And then he proposed to her the night before Thanksgiving, and he got another yes from Tammy herself. The couple had their engagement photos taken at the Springville Cemetery, and Chad and Tammy were married in March of 1990 in the Monte Temple. She got promoted at work. Chad was still finishing up his studies and progressing through BYU's journalism program. Life was good for them. Their first child, Garth Douglas Daybell, was born a month after Chad graduated from BYU with a bachelor's degree in communications. Tammy left her job, and she, Chad, and their son moved to Ogden, Utah, so that he could work on the copy desk of the Ogden Standard Examiner. Now, the copy chief of the examiner said that Chad Daybell seemed like a very standard mainstream LDS guy with a wife and a kid. And Chad would become known, he got a nickname, Chatterbox. Not because he talked a lot, but because he didn't. He didn't talk at all. He was very, very shy. He only spoke when he was asked a question, and he was known to blush if he heard a swear word. Chad was well-respected at work, though. He was seen as a family man who was devoted to his wife and child. He kept his head down. He did clean work. He never went out drinking with the other copy editors after his shift. He would just, like, go home to his family. And like I said, he just didn't talk much, and he did his work, and he was a good writer, and, and everybody was happy with him, you know? And um, he would go on to have another near-death experience in May of 1993 when he joined his family for a vacation in San Diego. They were all hanging out at the La Jolla Cove, and Chad was in the water looking for seashells when a 15-foot wave hit him like a ton of bricks. But he didn't feel it because moments before, a loud voice inside his head had told him to grab onto the rocks and hold tight. Chad said all of a sudden when the wave came down, he was in a tunnel of light. He was protected. And when he looked up to see what was going on, he saw the faces of Finity Daybell and Keith Daybell smiling down on him. And they started talking to him about the children that he and Tammy, who was pregnant again at this point, they were going to have all of these children and the missions that Chad was going to be responsible for completing throughout his life. Chad agreed to fulfill the assignments outlined by his forebears, and then Keith Daybell waved his hand, and Chad's spirit re-entered his body, and the wave subsided. So after this near-death experience, Chad felt his veil had been torn open even wider, leading to more enlightenment. And Chad would go on to claim that he experienced waking visions and also periods of deja vu. 
So Chad would eventually quit the paper in 1995 because he wanted to work on his own writing. He and Tammy and their now three kids, Garth, Emma, and Seth, moved back to Springville. And Chad began working at the cemetery again, stating that he went from writing headlines to digging graves. Tammy was rehired by the city as a receptionist. And in the winter of 1997, Chad was busy digging paths through the snow in the cemetery so that funeral guests would have a place to walk when he was again struck by his grandfather's voice, telling Chad that he needed to write books. And he said in that moment when he heard his grandfather's voice, Keith Daybell saying, Chad, go forth, write books. If you write it, they will read it. Chad said he said, I write. And he leaned against his shovel and he said out loud, that's great, but I have no idea what to write about. And then suddenly the entire plot to his first book flooded into his head. And this book would be called Errand for Emma. And it was a fictional book based on his daughter, who was three at the time. But in the book, she was a teenager who'd gone back in time to solve the mystery of her LDS family history. Errand for Emma was followed by One Foot in the Grave, which we've already talked about, and then another book called Doug's Dilemma, where Chad wrote himself as the character Doug Dalton, who finds himself in 1944, where he has to save his grandfather during World War II. Um, and <laughs> This just always reminds me of The Office whenever I hear about this Doug Dalton thing. I know I don't know if you're an Office fan, but I know a lot of people out there are. When Michael Scott was writing his series of books and he wrote he wrote a character like the hero Michael Scarn. <laughs> it always I got to watch that episode tonight now. I have to watch it tonight. I got to um I really got to watch. It. I haven't seen it before, but I've seen like obviously a lot of clips from it and but everyone's a huge fan of uh the Office. Hilarious. And the Dementor episode, the Prison Mike episode. Like, those are the two. There's so many more. But anyways, Michael Scarn, yeah. Let's take a quick break while I, uh, you know, put in my calendar that tonight I have to go up and watch The Office. Let's talk about food and how food is super important for, you know, living and surviving. But it also seems like we never have enough time to make sure that the food we're putting into our bodies is good and nutritious. I mean, at least for me, I know for a long time it was about convenience and what was fast and easy. But not anymore now that HelloFresh has been in my life, making it fun and easy to eat better. You can get mouthwatering seasonal recipes and fresh pre-measured ingredients delivered right to your door with HelloFresh, America's number one meal kit. And this summer, HelloFresh is here to take the work out of eating well and anything that makes uh, mealtime easier in the summer so that you can just have a good time, enjoy yourself, be outside swimming in the pool, going to amusement parks, traveling, whatever. The less you have to think about food, the better. But you also want to be eating well so that, you know, you can put on a, a bikini and not feel... <laughs> like like you ate too much. With HelloFresh, you can reach your goals with delicious calorie smart and protein smart lunch and dinner options. Plus they have new vegan recipes as well and they actually look really good. Usually I'd be like, I'm not gonna eat vegan food because I'm not vegan and I just feel like, they're not always good, but the HelloFresh vegan meals are, are pretty bomb. Figuring out what's for dinner this summer has never been easier because HelloFresh delivers exactly what you need to create delicious chef-inspired meals directly to you. I love the fact that the ingredients are not only fresh, with the seasonal veggies, fruits, and herbs being picked at peak ripeness and going from the farm to your table in less than seven days, but they are also pre-portioned. I'm big on not wasting food, and I love that HelloFresh sends you exactly what you need and only exactly what you need for each each recipe that means no food waste. And I love that they send you a recipe card with step-by-step -step instructions plus pictures, and it makes it virtually impossible to screw up. My family and I love spending time outside in the summer, and I also like entertaining. I like having friends over and entertaining, and HelloFresh is really helping this season because not only do they have new snacks, meals, and more to add to your weekly order, like their fun s'mores bundles for kids and you know adults who like s'mores like me, but they also make entertaining super easy with a selection of crowd-pleasing eats like their bratwurst bar with caramelized onions, Dijon slaw, and pineapple relish, or their snack board with pretzel bites, spiced bar nuts, and hot honey peach jam. I'm starving now after saying that. I'm right. <laughs> Sounds so good. Just be at the pool with like a HelloFresh snack board. I love it. Well, we are we are really in support of HelloFresh. What they do, not only are they easy to make, but they taste delicious, the meals. And if you guys want to try HelloFresh out for yourself, Derek's going to tell you how. That's right. Go to HelloFresh.com slash CrimeWeekly16 and use our code CrimeWeekly16 for 16 free meals 
plus free shipping. One more time, that's HelloFresh.com slash CrimeWeekly16. Use our code CrimeWeekly16 for 16 free meals plus free shipping. Check them out, guys. HelloFresh, America's number one meal kit. All right, we're back. So for a while, Chad worked for his publisher, so the people who were publishing his book, Cedar Fort, and he continued to write books. And this marked his entrance into the LDS circles, who would eventually turn him into a mini celebrity. He would travel around doing book signings and giving talks. But then in 2003, one of Chad's books, Chasing Paradise, would be banned by the biggest Mormon bookstore chain in the Western United States, Desiree Books. And apparently it was banned because um, he had written a scene where a angel drop kicks a bad spirit through a wall. And this was like controversial because it was violent or something. But Desiree Books was like, we don't know what he's talking about. Like, we didn't put his book in our stores because this, this, the projected sales were not looking good. So, like, there was no point to do that. So there's plenty of Mormon authors, and it just didn't look like a good – like, this book was going to make good sales. So he's probably being dramatic. But in 2004, Chad and Tammy started Spring Creek Book Company in a warehouse in Provo, Utah, because Chad was like, well, I'm going to publish my own books now, and I'm going to publish other Mormon authors who are maybe writing things that are a little bit more edgy and a little bit more, like, you know – controversial hot takes and they're going to be banned by like mainstream LDS um, enterprises and stuff. So I'm going to help them be like seen and heard and show them to the world. Makes more sense that he would start his own, you know, his own business, his own agency because, you know, yeah, he was doing so well without him. Yeah, exactly. You know? Like he's got to, he's got to take, take control of it mm. himself. Mm. And uh, the first book that they published was called Led by the Hand of Christ by LDS author Suzanne Freeman, who wrote about her recent near-death experience. And it's funny because Suzanne Freeman, um, all of these people came out of the woodwork to give interviews after after the kids went missing. Julie Rowe was one of them. And it's crazy because Julie Rowe is really annoying to me. Um, she initially came out and she defended Chad and she was like, he would never do this. And I'm speaking to Tammy and her spirit beyond the veil and this, this and that. And she says, I have to tell the truth. And like, she's just annoying. But Suzanne was a little bit more chill. And she was like, I thought it was weird that I wrote a book about near-death experiences. Chad was my publisher. We talked all the time. But he never told me about his near-death experiences, which she wouldn't even find out about until many years later when he finally wrote that biography that we've been reading from. And she's like, I just thought it was weird that like we'd had so much talk and conversation about like my near death experiences and he never shared his with me, even though he shared so many other things with me, which makes me believe Chad did not have those near death experiences, but he sort of like glommed on to other people who were like, I'm having near death experiences and this, this and that. And he made his own up, in my opinion, allegedly don't come for me. I think I think you might be on it. I mean, it wouldn't be the first time we've heard someone exaggerate their own life experiences to increase their clout or their credibility within the space of whoever the audience is they're trying to attract. I mean, that's not something that's uncommon mm -hmm. in many fields. Yeah, I agree. And um, at this this book company, Tammy was working there. Um, she was working in the back office. She was trying to keep the books, doing the accounting, trying to keep things in line while Chad was doing. I don't know what he was doing, but. Apparently, the company grew under Tammy's careful eye, and Chad kept writing books, including a five-part series he called Standing in Holy Places. The first book in that series, The Great Gathering, topped the LDS fiction bestsellers chart, as did the second novel, The Celestial City. And it kind of seemed like everything was going great. And Chad had told everyone that the Spring Creek Book Company was firing on all cylinders. But then something happened in 2008, something that sort of reflects what happened with Lori Vallow. So Chad and Tammy Daybell declared bankruptcy and the Spring Creek Book Company was forced out of business. The couple owed more than $200,000 to over 60 different creditors. And the bankruptcy filing showed that the business had only been generating an income of $2,000 a year. And that decreased each year. So they were making less than $2,000 a year as time went on. Tammy and Chad were making less than $50,000 a year combined, and they were trying to support a family of seven with that income, and it just wasn't working. Chad went back to digging graves, and Tammy worked part-time at an elementary school computer lab, but Tammy was going through a rough spot at this point, most likely because they're making all of these decisions based off of Chad's visions like where they move, what they do, what they open, what he writes. And she's over here like trying to be a good Mormon wife and following 
her man and listening to him and respecting him, but he's leading them to places that are not healthy. And so she became depressed. She had to become medicated. And Chad said she had a mental breakdown. And then she started escaping with a computer game called Frontierville. And Chad really hated this. He told Tammy that uh, he wanted her to stop playing the game and she didn't. And so then he said he'd gone to the temple and received a message from the other side to say that she needed to stop playing Frontierville immediately. So this just also shows you like this dude gets messages that are just convenient for him. Like whatever he needs to happen, he's getting a message, right? Like, oh, I hate that she's playing this game. Tammy, the spirits on the other side, they said you need to stop playing Frontierville, man. It's bad news. Cut it out. Cut it out. Like the spirits on the other side really have time to be worried about what freaking computer game Tammy Daybell's playing. Like, Get the fuck out of here, Chad. I cannot take him. I honestly thought you were about to say she was playing Farmville. It's kind of similar. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, everyone was, yeah. These are like Farmville, pioneers. On that. They're pioneers and they're like, set. yeah, it's like that. It's mm. kind of like that. Yeah. It really did seem that by this point, Tammy was over following the advice of Chad's spirit guides. So she did not stop playing Frontierville. <laughs> but it was the spring of 2012 when Chad told Suzanne Freeman, his first published author, that he was getting out of publishing because he had been told the call out was coming. So I've done a lot of like Mormon cases, not that they just seem to pop up a lot, but they do seem to pop up a lot. And I've done a lot of Mormon cases and I've never heard of this call out thing. So from what I can tell, the call out doesn't seem to be a mainstream LDS belief. But like I said, I went into some of these dark corners of the LDS like Internet world and I found some mention of the call out. And apparently it means that certain church members are going to leave everything behind and travel to different gathering places where they will be protected at the end of the world while the rest of the world's getting destroyed. People are going to, you know, stock up on food and supplies and then just leave one day. And like I was reading, <laughs> oh, it's not funny. It's actually really sad, but I laugh when I'm uncomfortable. So I was reading one person and they were like, what's going on? Like my parents are really into this like they've been going to these groups and all of a sudden they're talking about this call out that certain church leaders have talked about and they've they have like their entire garage filled with food and one whole extra bedroom in their house filled with food and they said that one day they're just going to leave when the call out happens and they're going to tell everyone they're going camping because they can't let just everyone know that they have to like get to safety and they're going to go and like bury their food supply so that it's safe and, and they know where to get it and and, he, and this guy was like my parents are wrecking themselves financially like they're mentally not well. They've been like going to this group and on this message board. And this message board or this website is called Avow. And Avow stands for another voice of warning. And Chad Daybell is super active on this Avow message board website thing that you can't even go to this website until you pay. Like I think it's like $60 a year. So to me, that already feels very cult-like, right? Like it's hidden and like behind a paywall, which is like if you have this important like message that you want to send to like your people, you're going to put it behind a paywall. No, you're not. You know, it's very like exploitative, like uh, kind of like a pyramid scheme sort of thing. So Chad Daybell told Suzanne Freeman that this was all happening. The end of the world was coming the following July and all the righteous would gather for the second coming. Obviously, nothing happened in July. <laughs> and by the following spring, Chad was like, oh, we're still here. So I'm going to relaunch the Spring Book Company to publish my new book series, Days of Turmoil, which was apocalyptic fiction, because that's the best kind of fiction. <laughs> like the end of the world fiction. And the following year in February, Chad found Julie Rowe on the Avow website. She had posted in the dreams and vision section of the website about a near-death experience she'd had in 2004. And Chad messaged her and he was like, listen, we were destined to meet because I had a vision of a tall, dark-haired woman. And that's you. And you should write a book and I'll publish it with my publishing company. So on May 14th, 2014, Spring Books published A Greater Tomorrow, My Journey Beyond the Veil by Julie Julie Rowe. The following summer, Chad heard a voice telling him that he needed to move his family to Idaho. And this happened after he spent some time with his wife and kids in Island Park in Idaho. And in October, Chad received his fork in the road vision, that's what he calls it, which was a voice telling him that moving to Rexburg, Idaho would be a tremendous blessing for his children and grandchildren. And somehow, Chad became convinced that Rexburg, Idaho was a sacred place where the 144,000 would gather and hunker down to write out the apocalypse that was raging through the world with all their cans of peas. A few weeks later, he announced to Tammy that he'd had a vision and they were moving to Rexburg, 300 miles away from everything they had known from their families, their friends, their community. 
And Tammy was kind of pissed at first. She was like, you're not you're just going to tell me where to move. And she complained about it to her sister. But then she was like, OK, well, I have to obey my husband. And they moved. They ended up actually living in Salem, just four miles outside of Rexburg. They uh, got a large four acre property. And this is the same property that the bodies of Tylee Ryan and J.J. Vallow would later be found buried on and disposed of on. And Chad got to work on his next book. He started promoting himself around the community who in Rexburg, they were mainly LDS anyways. He gave talks and he signed books and he basically talked to people to see who thought like he did or who he could convince to think like he did. He was also lucky that his author, Julie Rowe, had become a big name on the LDS speaking circuit. And by default, he would go with her to conferences and meetings. And because he was with her, he was front and center. And one of these conferences focused on near-death experiences. And all of a sudden, Chad had a near-death experience, right? And Julie let Chad talk for 10 minutes before he introduced her. And even though she was the main speaker, she let him take some time so that he could introduce himself to everybody. And people found him to be genuine, unassuming, soft-spoken, and truly devout in what he believed in. Within no time, Chad had found himself his own little following in Rexburg. And Rexburg resident Eric Smith said that Chad did very well with smaller groups, like more like one on one where he could kind of give you personal attention, especially with females. And Eric Smith said that Chad would hypnotize the women with talk of end days and how only the strong and faithful would survive. Eric Smith said, quote, I've seen him use those skills. There was always a little group of women and he would be drawn to them. They would get that kind of googly eyed look and they'd ask him questions and he would answer in a very personal way, end quote. So, yes, Chad did have a way of making women feel special. So while Chad became an in-demand celebrity in the LDS literary world, his wife Tammy had started working as a librarian at Madison Middle School, trying to keep the faith in her husband's vision and grand plans. And then in 2017, preparing a people was formed. We've already talked about preparing a people. This is when they come to be. And on July July 25th, 2017, they held their first conference at the Rexburg Tabernacle featuring Chad Daybell as their main speakers because preparing a people's owners or like founders were husband and wife Michael and Nancy James who'd known Chad back in Springville and they respected him very greatly. So they wanted him to be a part of this and he was at their first conference. Over the next year or so, Chad was featured often on the PAP podcast, which was called Rexburg, Idaho, the promised land. And he was front and center every time PAP held a conference. He finally felt as if he was being seen and respected for the first time in his life. And remember earlier I talked about a woman who had moved to Idaho and then she got hired by this guy who was like, I had a vision and I need to give you a job. And this guy introduced her to Chad Daybell and Julie Rowe. Well, when she met Chad Daybell, she said, quote, he was idolized. He was just this remarkably well-spoken, kind man who was helping bring people together to prepare for the return of Christ, end quote. Chad met Melanie Gibb, who we've talked about being Lori's friend, in the fall of 2017 at a preparedness camp in Ogden, Utah. And he introduced Melanie to the PAP people. And she was then a part of preparing people. And she was appointed as their official Arizona representative, which is why she would end up having this gathering at her house and kind of like pulling people in and recruiting them. Like, let's be honest, that's what they're doing. Why do they need a representative in every state, right? Because they're recruiting people to their their group. And in June of 2018, Melanie put together Arizona's first PAP conference and she asked a newly unemployed Chad Daybell to speak at it. Five weeks later, Chad would see Melanie again at a PAP conference in St. George, Utah. And this time she had a friend with her, Lori Vallow, his eternal wife throughout time. And before we wrap up, I want to quickly talk about a necklace that Chad Daybell had. This was a gold necklace with an owl on it. And he claims that he found it. He was like, they had church and then everybody left and he was cleaning up and putting everything straight. And he found this gold owl necklace on the floor, like under a pew. And he said that he heard a voice saying like, this necklace has been left here for you by God. And like, you should take this necklace. It's a, a special magical item. And Chad would use this necklace to figure out if people had dark or light spirits. And he would ask it questions, almost like it's a magic ball, like a, like you know, like a fortune teller's ball or, or something like that. And he was known to bring this necklace out while he and his followers were sitting and talking. And then he would like ask the necklace questions. Eric Smith said, quote, he'd hold it up and let it swing. If it swung right to left, it would mean yes. If it was a circle, it was no. It was interesting and fascinating. And I was touched by it, end quote. 
Chad would try to figure out who celebrities had been in their past lives. We're going to talk about this, but he's obsessed with like past lives and who people were in their past lives, who he was in his past life. And he would start making lists about which of these celebrities had light or dark spirits. And apparently he thought that Oprah had one of the darkest spirits he'd ever seen. Now, this parlor trick would actually help build Chad a very loyal following because people thought he was magical. And as people like Chad usually do, he pulled from the actual Book of Mormon and he sort of like twisted things to draw people in. So in the Book of Mormon, we do hear about magical items that give their users special powers. And this was Chad finding some janky owl necklace and using it basically like a con man and being like, oh, I can answer your questions. I can see your ancestry. I can see who you were in your past lives, things like that. And um, Eric Smith said that Chad would research people before he did this, right? He would research people that he knew he was going to see and find out like about their ancestry and stuff. And then he would use what he discovered with the necklace later to kind of like draw people in and make them think like, oh, this guy's really something. Yeah, it's a scam. Yeah. It's He's a, a magician. Scam. Not saying magicians are scam. I don't want any magicians coming after me and I mean, casting a spell on me or something. If they're a scam, they can't cast a spell on you. <laughs> Valid point. Valid point, <laughs> Mrs. Harlow. <laughs> so, I mean, personally, I'm... I'm really amused by this. I'm sorry. So I think it's kind of funny that Chad was like known to sort of like- palm readers? Well, like just Chad, yeah, palm readers or like the people who used to do like seances and stuff, right? And they'd like figure out a way to like dislocate the bones in their feet so they could make these like weird tapping sounds. And like, it's a tale as old as time, but people still fall for it, which I get. I get. We all want to believe in magic. We all want to believe there's something bigger than us out there. Like, I get it. And it's harmless, I think, until it's not. Right. You know? So um, I just think that this is very ironic and, and very funny to me because Chad was known to sort of like woo these ladies and impress them with his big spirit <laughs> and his connection. Oh, I see what you did yeah, there. Yeah, you saw that? Yeah. <laughs> so glad we're on the same page. Mm. <laughs> and his connection to like these spirits beyond the veil, you know, people were like, oh my God, his veil and his head is like ripped wide open, man. Like just all sorts of shit's coming through there. Anything could happen when Chad Daybell's around. And he's just otherwise, outside of this, he's like kind of pudgy, kind of pale, very socially awkward, you know, not like your typical ladies, man. But when he pulls out the damn owl necklace and he starts working his magic, all of a sudden he's got a ring of ladies around him and he's like, okay, okay, I see what daddy Chad can do here. And it's just funny because... Lori's over here getting close to Melanie Gibb as soon as she finds out that Melanie knows Chad because she wants to get close to Chad. And then when Chad does meet Lori, and we're going to talk about this next time, he says like he was already married to her and they had been together during the time of Jesus Christ and they were in an eternal union that was going to change the world forever. And it's like she played this game to get close to him and he started working to get close to her as soon as he met her. And it's like they were manipulating and playing each other. And like these were both manipulative people who just wanted to use each other and take advantage of each other. And like each of them probably thought they had the upper hand because they never encountered somebody as evil and manipulative as they were. So who can really be called the victim here? Like I know we've asked like who led and who followed. And I still think Lori ended up leaving. I'm, like, I'm waiting till we get to the end, but I got some comments because I've been writing a lot of notes here. Anyways, I'll let you get to that. They they were just equally manipulative and calculated. But I do think that Lori has a big ego and has high self-esteem and Chad has low self-esteem and needs like constant approval from external sources. So I definitely think at the end he was the weaker personality and she used him as a tool basically to like get in because he already is established in this like LDS literary world and this uh, in this like preparing a people thing. He's already established. She wants to be an important person. She also wants to be an important person. She's going to use him as a stepping stone to get there just like she's used everybody else in her life. So I think she was using him. I don't think that she you she loved him at all. I'm with you. But I, I will say that I going into this episode was of the mindset when we, because we asked that question and a lot of you responded to it saying Lori Vallow was the puppeteer. And it does feel like, although she wanted to meet him, there might have been something that kind of naturally brought them together with some mutual friends. But then I do feel like I asked myself this question if Lori Vallow doesn't come into the picture, does Chad Daybell still do half the things he's doing? And no. from, I think so. No. I think so. See, that's that's where we that's where we differ because I feel like he was already on this path 
before he met Lori. He was someone naturally who was going this direction. Do I think Lori enhanced what he was what he was doing? Do I think she gave him the confidence to do even more? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think it was this recipe where she took what he was already on the path of doing and found a way to harness that for him because of her innate ability, which we already discussed, her ability to identify the audience and then present information or present themselves in a way that the audience would be receptive to what they had to say. That element is something that in most people happens naturally. You either have it or you don't. And I don't know if Chad necessarily had that on his own, but his the ideology that he was trying to convey to others was falling flat for the most part until Lori came into the picture and was able to help him in that area. But I feel like... So the ideology he was trying to convey to others was not falling flat. People were buying it. He was like super popular. Like I said, he was like a celebrity, dude. It was not falling flat. They were buying it. And I think he would have been content with that for the rest of his life. Okay. But you got a woman like Lori who comes in and she sees a man like Chad. And this is the power that women have over men. Like, we're going to act like women don't have any power over men. They do. She sees a man like Chad who clearly is lacking something, who clearly is lacking any guidance. And she's like, I'm going to make him feel like a king. I'm going to build him up. I'm going to make him feel like the most special, valuable person ever. And because making a man like Chad feel that way is so powerful, he is going to follow me until the ends of the earth. She's the stronger personality. She's the more confident personality. She wanted what he had, which was that celebrity, which was thousands of people watching her, hearing her talk about her visions, hearing her talk about her mission, which, like, as we'll find out, she's a god. She's a literal god, okay? (laughs) Not just, like, she's on a mission. She believes she's a god who's on earth to, like, save everyone. Not everyone, just the people she wants to save, right? (laughs) Mm. she's got an ego whereas he i think he would have been fine with the attention he's like a a kid who wasn't popular in school and maybe kind of you know just wanted friends and so he felt by like doing this parlor trick with the owl and just giving people and what they wanted and telling them what they wanted he would have this these friends and this circle of people sycophants around him always just kissing his ass and telling him what he wanted to hear that would have been enough for him i think yeah i want i i I definitely think he had something where you know this is the one part we differ on i feel like she amplified what he was going to do. Like, I don't know what his capabilities were on his own. I don't think they were worth what they ended up being, but he was just this author who had this following of people. And I feel like it went to a level where he was even more popular than he would have been if he hadn't met uh, Lori. I feel like she was able to. No, because as soon as they meet, their their plans go into effect really quick. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, maybe they did appear on like podcasts. I guess we'll see. We'll see as we go through this. Like, I, 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 How it I, shakes out. Moral of the story, I feel like this episode has changed my per- perspective slightly. Not like, oh, oh my God, this is life altering. Now I feel completely different. still feel like Lori was a huge part of this equal partnership as to where we're going to end this series when we finish. I don't feel like she was manipulated by Chad. If I had to say one or the other, I would say more than likely Lori was manipulated. Uh, Lori manipulated Chad. But mm, yeah. I will say that hearing some of the things you're talking about as far as Chad's concerned and these tricks that he's pulling to convince people of what he's what he his beliefs makes me think that he may have been a bigger contributing factor to the overall decision to do what they did to the children than just Lori convincing him i think that he fed off he fed off her but yet there were a lot of the undertones that he believed in personally even before meeting Lori yeah. We'll see. I mean, I don't think it's going to change a lot of people's opinions as far as like, oh, Lori's the puppeteer or a puppet. You know, I I, th- I, f- I still feel like she had a lot to do with this, but I will say I'm more, okay, put in number perspective, I was going to, partnership before this episode, 70-30 being heavily in favor of Lori, I'm now like 60-40. But like, where's his motive? You know, like at the end of the day, it made his life worse, everything, and- Her kids are the ones that, and I mean, his wife ends up dead too, but I think that had a lot to do with the insurance money and also him desperately being like obsessed with Lori to the point where it was like, you kill your husband, I'll kill my wife, we'll be together, you know? But there was a point where you talked about his necklace and it it being able to tell him who was, who was a light and who was a dark spirit. And I wonder if when it came to the children, however he got there, there was, there was a decision made that they were dark spirits. 
Now, I don't know the rest of the story. I don't know how this ends, but just where we are right now, part three, could yeah. Chad could Chad have said something? Listen, it's not me. It's coming through the necklace. Yeah. They are dark spirits. We we don't. This is now no longer our choice. It's coming so, through the necklace. So that I mean that's that's what I'm saying. Like, but I mean, then you got Lori's dumbass taking the owl necklace's word for it and killing her children. Like, was she manipulated or was she kind of just looking for a reason? That's the question. And I think we're going to answer that as we continue to go on right now. I don't think she was manipulated. I think she believed, I think she truly did believe in a lot of what Chad was saying. He, she was more so amplifying his voice because she had the charisma. She knew how to target an audience. So he, she took what he was able to do, his signal, if you want to put it in that way, and amplify it to even more ears and eyes because of her ability to, as we said at the beginning, she had the natural skill set of seeing her target audience and knowing how to, how to gravitate toward, how to, how to get them to believe in her. Right. Mm -hmm, She passed mm -hmm. that. She taught him. She did it with Mrs. USA. She did it with Wheel of Fortune. She did it in many elements of her life. Every every element of her life, I would, would, you know, say. And Chad and she rubbed off a lot on Chad, giving him that ability to do it by watching her. Now he was gave him confidence, right? Gave him that confidence. So it afforded him the opportunity to take what he believed in organically and get it to get it seen and heard by even more people. And I wonder if there was a combination where the decision was made about the children where it was deeper than that. It was something that came from Chad's beliefs as far as what he was able to determine through his trinkets, if you will. So I'm fascinated by this case because now I feel like it's not just one person pulling the strings. There might've been multiple people in charge of different strings. Yeah. And I mean, like, dude, I can't wait for next episode because it gets so like, I wanted to like put it in here, but I knew it was going to go too long. No, this I was really, a lot. This I did was a have lot to, to give, kind of digest. Yeah, we went so deep into Chad, into Lori's background for two episodes. I needed to give Chad like the episode so you could really just understand like he's been claiming to have visions since he was very young. Like once again. That's what I'm saying. This is all before is Lori. Is it true? I don't think it's true though. I do. I, I don't think, think he was, was actually. From the beginning. I don't think he was actually having the time visions. Start, the time he wanted to kill that bee. I don't think he was actually having visions. I think that once he started like publishing these other authors and they were having like near death experiences and stuff, he's like, man, they got way more to offer than I do. Mm. You know, like their story is way more cool. Their story is way more interesting. And how am I supposed to be this like prolific figure in this community if I don't have something equally cool or more cool? Look at publishers telling him that, hey, your story's not that interesting. It's not going to sell. Can you do more near death experiences and ripping of the veil? We're going to need more of that. Mm, Okay. We need more of that. The definitely this is not going to be made into a movie if unless there's at least two near death experiences, Chad. Mm. I'm I'm really interested to see the comments this week because I wonder if I'm like the outlier. Like am I just the only one? I think You you will never convince me that Lori Vallow is manipulated by anybody, by the way. Ever in my life will you convince me that that woman would allow herself to be manipulated by anyone. She's the kingpin, man. She's running the show. You can see it in her eyes she's she's not sweet and innocent she's a warrior she's old she's been fighting this battle for a millennia man all right she ain't sweet and innocent don't get it twisted nobody's saying she is i just wonder as we get there and i know you probably already know what has been said so don't spoil it but i wonder who was the the driving force behind the decision to do what they did to the children i don't think we know Okay, so and because that's, Lori's blaming Chad and Chad's blaming Lori now, no. see, see and how you know their the eternal, is? their eternal love bond that goes back to the days of Jesus Christ really uh, broke quick when they're sitting in a courtroom. Okay, and that's the question that maybe I don't know. Maybe you think it's a good question for this episode, but it's: Do you think, based on the trajectory that Chad was going to, you kind of already answered it that you don't think so. You think he would have been happy just doing what he was doing, but I wonder Might if be, yeah. it, if it would have gotten here, whether it was. Uh, Lori's children or someone else, but but this was where this was leading, where he was going to get to a point where he felt that he had the right to decide who lived and who died based on his perception of them. Were they a dark spirit? Were they a light spirit? He was going to create himself into this God where he decided who, 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 who remained here. And I, would that have happened without Lori or was it because of Lori? And like you said, we don't know. They're blaming each other. But I wonder what the consensus is amongst our listeners and our viewers as far as now that you're telling this story and you gave a lot about Chad tonight, more than I expected based on our first episode and where I was like, oh, I can see where this is going. I was wrong. Chad's definitely a player in this game. 
And I don't know, man. I just see him as like a weak. See, pathetic, that's why this is great. Because I don't pathetic, like low self esteem, like weak. Did I say weak yet? You weak, said weak, but you can say it more again. Weak, freaking B killer. Mm. All right. I don't see him as anything special. I don't see him as anything like charismatic or manipulative. I think that he found his niche along among these like, you know, stay at home moms who were like, oh my God, Chad, tell me about my future. Tell me about my past. Am I, are you in it? You know, like weird people who got, ain't got nothing going on and just looking for something to like give them some freaking dopamine in their day. And he would have been happy with that. You know, he would have been happy with that. But at the end of the day, like, yeah, Chad's the guy who's talking about the dark and light spirits. But we remember what Lori said, which is some people die and that's their mission to die. So did he talk about light and dark spirits? And then Lori's over here like, well, maybe it's the dark spirits mission to die. <laughs> you know, like what's going on? Because he ain't never talked about how dark spirits need to be dying. I don't know. We're going to have to see next time because we're going to it's next. Next episode is going to be a wild ride. Stay tuned, y'all. Anything else? That's it. I think we're good. Okay. It's one o'clock in the morning. It's one o'clock in the morning, but that was a good, that was a good episode. That was it's three a.m. I must be lonely. All right, guys. As always, like, comment, subscribe on the video if you're watching on YouTube. If you're listening on audio, uh, we really we we did it last week. We could do it again. Please leave a five star review on Apple Podcasts, and if you're on Spotify, they don't allow you to leave comments, but you can definitely leave reviews. It gets us up on the charts. We really do appreciate it. More people will see it. More people will hear it. Uh, as always, we will see you next week. Stay safe out there. Bye.